Now here with the latest afternoon headlines, it's the ITV Lunchtime News. Mixed messaging for the businesses battling the pandemic. With millions off work, number 10 says it's crucial to self-isolate if alerted by the NHS COVID app. But one minister is advising it's up to companies and individuals. The guidance is still that you should isolate, but clearly we want people to, to, be, to be doing that. But that's guidance, that's not law. We want people to make informed decisions. Also this lunchtime, a record number of people crossed the channel in a single day and they're still coming. An extreme weather warning is in place for parts of the UK as temperatures are set to rise again. And it's blast off for another billionaire. First Sir Richard Branson, now former Amazon boss Jeff Bezos prepares to head into space. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Lucrezia Millerini. Good afternoon. There's been mixed messaging from the government today on how businesses should handle the staff shortages being caused by the rocketing numbers of workers who are self-isolating. The business minister today told worried companies that isolation is not always mandatory. He said that if the advice to isolate comes from the NHS COVID app, then it is just that advice and not a legal requirement. But since then, Downing Street has released a statement saying it is crucial to isolate if notified by the app and that firms should support staff in doing so. It is a recipe for confusion that will leave many wondering what to do. Here's our political correspondent, Romley Weeks. With hundreds of thousands of people currently isolating, supermarkets are warning of empty shelves, the NHS of disruption to care, and tubes and trains are being taken out of service. Officially, the government insists people should still isolate if they're advised to do so by the NHS COVID app. But today, a minister wrote to business to stress that is not a legal requirement. Is that now the government advice? That's never changed. So uh, the legal requirement is to, uh, you have to isolate if you are um, contacted by the NHS contact tracers or if you're claiming isolation payments. Not everybody has the app for starters and so it's always been there to give you an informed, make an informed decision. We want people to use it. It's saved an estimated 8,000 lives today. What's the point of saying you're, you want people to use it if you're saying that people don't actually have to follow the advice of their contacts? Well, I'm saying that the law has literally not changed. That's always the, been the, the case. The law hasn't changed, but it's the, always the, been the guidance the, that you the, should isolate the, your yeah, things. And, the, and the, guidance, the guidance is still that you should isolate, but clearly we want people to, to, be, to be doing that. But that's guidance, that's not law. And yet, minutes later, Number 10 released this statement. It's crucial people isolate when they're told to do so, either by NHS Test and Trace or by the NHS COVID app. Businesses should be supporting employees to isolate. They should not be encouraging them to break isolation. Clear? This scientist advising the government certainly doesn't think so. It looks as if the government is making up policy as it goes along. If it's making up policy as it goes along, then how on earth is anybody supposed to know what they should uh, and must do? And if people don't know what they should and must do, how on earth can you expect them to act responsibly? It's a complete shambles. At this nightclub, which reopened on Sunday, the owner believes the isolation system, due to be overhauled on the 16th of August, needs to be changed now. The problem with the ping system is that it's wildly inaccurate, wildly ridiculed, and 35% have now deleted it. Of course, uh, it's going to have an effect on the whole uh, of, of not just hospitality, but absolutely uh, everybody that has this as a headache. After a weekend in which the two most senior members of the government briefly attempted to avoid isolation themselves, and with a new poll suggesting one in ten people have already deleted the NHS app, the government's policy on a key weapon against rising infection levels is in chaos. Romilly Weeks, ITV News. I'm joined now by our political editor, Robert Peston. Robert, um, so to isolate or not to isolate, that seems to be the question, doesn't it? Is the government trying to send one message to businesses, another message to everyone else? So I think that's a sort of kind interpretation. I think most people would just say, as Stephen Riker said, uh, it's a bit of a shambles. Uh, you know, we had two business ministers, in fact, today uh, pointing out something which is factually 
correct, which is that if you are pinged by the app, that doesn't have the same status in law as being rung up by test and trace. If you're rung up by test and trace and told to isolate under the law, you have to isolate. If you are pinged, it has always been the case that it's advisory. But up to now, most people thought if you're pinged, it's my moral duty uh, to uh, isolate at home. Two ministers said today, use your judgment. That looked like a pretty strong signal to people not to isolate if they couldn't think about, you know, when they'd been in contact with somebody who might have the virus. And at a time when, you know, hundreds of thousands of people are isolating, businesses in trouble, schools not functioning properly, you know, th th there was just a sense, I think, around the place this morning, the government was telling people, well, maybe you don't have to isolate. Now, Downing Street then stepped in immediately. I just actually asked a question um, at the morning lobby meeting about all this, and they said, no, absolutely, you do have to isolate. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, depending on, on when you heard which message, you're going to be get walking around today, you know, thinking either you do or you don't. This is not a satisfactory situation. And there's a second thing where, you know, essentially the government's position seems to have changed. Last night, the Prime Minister said, because he could see vital businesses really struggling to keep going, transport keep struggling, mm -hmm. supermarkets struggling to keep food on the shelves because so many people are being pinged. He said, if you're in an essential service, you may get an exemption from isolation. Today, the government, and we were expecting a list of the essential services. Today, we were told no list. Essentially, if a business that thinks it's an essential service wants to get an exemption, it has to contact a ministry, go through some paperwork, and maybe it'll be exempted. So again, total confusion. Mm, certainly a lot to pick through, isn't there, Robert? Thank you. Next, this lunchtime, a record number of migrants entered the UK yesterday by crossing the channel in small boats. The PA News Agency counted at least 430 people arriving on the coast of Kent, including women and children. Sangeeta Lal is here with more. Sangeeta, presumably the good weather has had something to do with this, but are we likely to see more people today as well? Possibly, and this is something that the government says it's trying to gain some control over. It's worth noting this is something that the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, says... She wants to try and prevent and make it a crime for people to cross the channel the way they are in this circumstance in the future. I'll talk about that in a little moment, but let's just discuss the figures for now. Already this year, the number of migrants that have crossed the channel is almost reached the entire number of those that crossed in 2020. As you say, yesterday, 430 people crossed uh, the English Channel. That includes women and children. And around 50 people were seen landing on the beach in one dinghy. It's just a very, very dangerous route for people to take. But many of these migrants are doing this because they're fleeing violence, torture, persecution. They often set off from France on board unseaworthy dinghies uh, and pay people to get across. Now, the number of crossings have shot up in recent years. Last year's total was more than quadrupling the number of arrivals in 2019. Despite this, the UK continues to see far fewer boat arrivals and asylum claims than much of Europe. But this is something the UK government is trying to get mm. um, control of and trying to stop. The Home Secretary Priti Patel says she's trying to pass a bill that, if passed, would mean that um, those migrants who are crossing without permission to enter the country would possibly face four years in prison. So she's trying to make it a crime. It's something that charities say is inhumane um, and unworkable, mm. but it is the way the UK government says it wants to prevent this from happening in the future. All right, Sangeeta, thank you. Well, the Met Office says yesterday was the hottest day of the year so far in all four parts of the UK. And for much of the country, the forecast for today is even hotter. An amber warning for extreme heat is in place in parts of England and Wales, alongside a separate warning for people tempted to cool off in open water to take extreme care. Well, ITV weather presenter Alex Beresford joins us now. Alex, uh, this is the first time the new amber heat warning has been used. Uh, what does it mean exactly? Well, Lucrezia, in the last hour, I can now tell you that the Met Office have issued a further extreme heat warning for Northern Ireland. That kicks in throughout much of tomorrow, as well as the warning that's in place until Thursday across South Wales, the southwest of England, 
down towards Portsmouth and then up into the West Midlands. And the reason that the Met Office have issued this new warning system is because we are expecting to see more of extreme events like this happening as we head into the future. And, and much like the uh, storm naming uh, system that the Met Office brought in a few years ago, which has been very successful, it's going to help create awareness so that we can keep the young, the elderly and also people vulnerable safe as we head through a period of weather like this with temperatures expected to hold up at around 30 degrees plus as we head through the next few days. So it, it, these warnings are really necessary and they're going to mm. help people plan the day and think about how they can keep cool and very safe. And Alex, you talk about, you know, the warnings to keep people safe. We've seen a tragic loss of life in recent days. There's also a warning to people looking to, to call down not to go swimming in open water, isn't there? I was actually looking at the deaths that we get each year uh, from the heat, and it's around 2,000. And that can be, you know, babies, the elderly, the vulnerable, people dying from uh, heat stroke, but also open water swimming. I mean, I'm stood beside the Thames at the moment. It looks very flat on the surface, but some of those currents that run underneath are very strong, and you can get into trouble very, very quickly. I saw a lot of young people jumping into the Thames yesterday. I would always advise against it unless it's part of an organized group you've got uh, you know life jackets lifeguards that can actually help keep you safe so please don't jump into open water i know the heat is there for all of us to enjoy and it can be very exciting but sometimes it can cause a lapse in judgment of course i have a full weather report for you coming up in a few minutes time towards the end of the news all right alex thank you for that and thank you for that advice well, an enormous wildfire that has scorched more than 300,000 acres is continuing to blaze in the U.S. state of Oregon. At least 2,000 residents have already been evacuated, with more preparing to flee. The so-called bootleg fire has destroyed at least 160 homes and buildings and consumed an area larger than the city of Los Angeles. More than 2,000 firefighters have been deployed to the area. And it's currently the, the largest fire in the United States right now. It's, uh, and it's not going to be slowing down. It's going to be hard work for all the fire personnel to get this uh, extinguished, especially with the, the dry vegetation and the winds and the weather that we've been having. It's been a, a very... Still to come. We're with Prince Charles and Camilla as they make an eco visit to the Isles of Scilly. And a woman trained to be one of the first astronauts is just minutes away from finally reaching space at the age of 82. E-scooters are becoming a common sight on British streets, despite not being completely legal everywhere. Many see them as an eco-friendly new form of transport, but others say they are too dangerous. Well, hundreds of injuries and at least three deaths have resulted from crashes involving e-scooters, including a 16-year-old boy over the weekend. And another objection comes from campaigners for blind people who say they've made towns and cities no-go zones for those with limited sight and should be banned completely. Well, this afternoon, the UK's National Federation of the Blind are handing in a petition to Downing Street asking for a halt to all e-scooter trials. And I'm joined now by one of those campaigners, Sarah Gayton. Sarah, thanks so much for talking to us this lunchtime. This petition will be handed into Downing Street later on this afternoon. Just to outline for us the main issues with e-scooters when it comes to blind people or those with limited sight. Well, the e-scooter riders literally take over the pavement. They're absolutely out of control and they're terrorising and terrifying blind, visually impaired people and other pedestrians that use that environment. You know, the illegal e-scooters are regulated, but they're still out of control. So we want these trials brought to a halt and we want safety back on our pavements. Um, and Sarah, when you, know, when you say that people are being terrified by these e-scooters, can you just give us some you know, examples of people who have spoken to you about their experiences and what they're telling you? Oh, definitely. There was a, a lady whose uh, father in Liverpool, you know, he went out, he tripped over some e-scooters, he skinned his knees and he, he hurt his back, you know, and he's so embarrassed now, he doesn't want to even talk about it because he thinks that people can't, he can't access his own um, his city independently. But I've witnessed riders myself, they've terrified me. Literally, people have been pulled out of the way of these riders, sort of riding behind them. I've watched them 
do a full skid and lift the e-scooter high up to waist height in front of pedestrians. It's terrifying for people, you know, on that pedestrian environment. Um, and of course, you know, Sarah, people who do ride e-scooters, they will say, you know, that's not everyone, that's only a minority of people. How confident are you, though, that the government will actually listen to the petition, given that we are seeing these trials now across the UK and an increasing number of people using these e-scooters? They seem to be becoming more and more a part of our everyday life. Well, they can't be normalised. I mean, the trials, again, more people use them, but they're still using them on the pavement. They're using them on pedestrian crossings. And this is simply not safe. The pedestrian, the vulnerable pedestrian, blind, visually impaired people, people in wheelchairs, have been forgotten about. So it, they have to take note of it. We are part of that society. And for the illegal e-scooters, the private ones, you know, they ha the shops have to stop selling them. You know, they cannot allow people to keep using them because there's the tragic... There's been four people died in sort of just over four weeks in, in Britain, you know, and people have been seriously injured. The government, you know, it should make the blood of those politicians run cold what's happening on the streets. We can't transform our cities, we can't reduce the dominance of the car by bringing a new form of mobility that still causes complete havoc to pedestrians and also is inherently un unsafe and unstable for the rider. Um, Sarah, you know, do you get the sense that you might get some opposition as well? Um, you, you know, there is an environmental argument, isn't it, in favour of e-scooters. We want to get less people using public transport. Um, but also the government says the whole purpose of these trials really is to assess safety and understanding of how they could properly be used in society. Do you think that there is some kind of a compromise solution here? Absolutely not. You've got people being killed on the street using illegal ones. You've got people seriously hurt using illegal ones. You're getting people seriously hurt using the trial e-scooters. And you've got pedestrians in Liverpool, you know, it's been it's branded as a no-go area. You know, people, a blind gentleman, a visually impaired uh, person is, is telling his colleagues to take a taxi. So how can that be green? How can you take away other people's ability to walk independently and have their active transport shattered because of these e-scooters? And a lot of people can walk. They can cycle, you know, they can take the bus, they can take the, the, the train, you know, there are different options other than these scooters. OK. There's, there's not really a natural place for them on the road All right. or on the pavement. Well, Sarah Gayton, thank you for talking to me. You hand that petition, as I said, in this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. A Premier League footballer has been arrested on suspicion of child sex offences. The player, who cannot be named for legal reasons, was arrested by Greater Manchester Police last Friday and released on bail. Now, the government is said to be considering raising national insurance payments by 1% to fund social care. It will be for both employers and employees and will add an extra £10 billion a year. Prince Charles and Camilla are visiting the Isles of Scilly this lunchtime. Their first stop was a school where pupils are trying to make a difference to the environment. Our royal editor Chris Ship is there and he sent us this report. Well, one of the attractions of the Isles of Scilly is not just its beauty, as you can probably see behind me, but also its remoteness. It's a group of islands, about 200 of them in total, but only five of them are inhabited. And they are 30 miles uh, southwest of Land's End. And one of the things that Prince Charles, who's uh, visiting this island here today, has been learning about is how these islands in this corner of the United Kingdom are vulnerable to climate change. In fact, they are more vulnerable here than anywhere else in the British Isles. And that's because, not only where they are, uh, but because that a lot of the land here is only three metres above sea level. So not easy to imagine it on a day like today, as beautiful as it is here, but in the winter when the storms hit, any small rises in sea level could have a catastrophic impact for these islands. They're full of tourists right now. This is the summer season. Uh, but there's a lot of concern here from the school that we've just been visiting to the residents of these islands, only 2,000 of them, that they could be so badly hit by climate change. And they want world leaders, when they meet at the UN Climate Change Summit in Glasgow in November, to finally do something about this issue. Oh, Chris Ship reporting there. And finally, just nine days after Sir Richard Branson became the first entrepreneur to claim he reached the edge of space in his own rocket, another billionaire is about to do the same. The former Amazon boss, Jeff 
Bezos, you can just see there, is due to launch in the next few minutes in his Blue Origin spacecraft. And because of a disagreement about how high above the Earth's space actually starts, Bezos thinks he, not Branson, will actually be the first to reach it. Sally Bidolf has more. Nine, eight, launch pad ready. Rocket ready. Canada! Wally! Crew ready. Within the next hour, these four will make history on a tourist flight to the edge of space, going even higher than Richard Branson did last week. Amazon billionaire Jeff Bezos and his brother Mark will blast off with 82-year-old Wally Funk, who'll be the oldest person ever in space, and Oliver Damon, who at 18 will be the youngest. I'm so excited and curious. You know, everybody who has been to space, every astronaut comes back and they say that it changed them somehow. They see the thin limb of the Earth's atmosphere, realize how fragile the Earth is. They see it's just one planet. So I don't know how it's going to change me, but I know it's going to, and I'm excited to find out how. I think it's the ultimate dream for so many people to go to space. I guess my first memories of space were Thunderbirds. <laughs> I was a big fan of that, watched every single episode there was. A dream come true for everyone, but no one more so than Wally Funk. You're going to be an astronaut. Oh, finally! Having trained for it in the 60s, she's one of the most accomplished pilots in the States, racking up almost 20,000 flying hours and seemingly powered by rocket fuel herself. I didn't think that I would ever get to go up. Nothing has ever gotten in my way. And they said, Wally, you're a girl. You can't do that. I said, guess what? Doesn't matter what you are. You can still do it if you want to do it. And I like to do things that nobody has ever done. As the minutes tick down to blast off, Wally speaks for everyone. Woo! Ha <laughs> ha! I can hardly wait. Sally Biddulph, ITV News. A reminder of our top story. Number 10 says it's crucial to self-isolate if you are pinged by the NHS COVID app. It comes just hours after a government minister told worried companies that isolation is not always mandatory. More on that in the ITV Evening News at 6.30. I'll be here for that. But from everyone here on the Lunchtime team, bye-bye.